forward to that. Okay? All right. Luke chapter 6 is where we find ourselves. I, I want you to imagine with me that you are Jewish. Can you do that for a moment? Imagine you are a Jewish person, and it is the Sabbath day. So it's, it's a Saturday in, in Jewish culture. And you happen to remember the fourth commandment. And the fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now that sounds, for outsiders, that's like, oh, okay, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But Moses had written that in Exodus, and he had specifically written it so that the Jewish people did not work, right? They had the same bad habits that we do, and that is we can be, all become workaholics, and not just work, but work too much, and we don't worship, right? Because actually what you end up working for, you eventually end up worshiping. And so Jesus, or God said there in Exodus 20, hey, I want to set aside a, a, some time for you to worship. A, a day of worship, a day of rest, a day of rejuvenation. And what had happened was this, is that the, the Jewish leaders took this one command and they created 39 categories. The 39 categories. Uh, 39 categories, and within each category, there were dozens of applications. You can see how this gets tricky real quick. Like, so for instance, uh, you could not travel more than a mile. So if you've ever lived in a neighborhood where there's a synagogue, uh, oftentimes Jewish people live very close to that synagogue, and primarily the reason for that is this: is because they have a limited amount of walking. Uh, space on, on, the, on the Sabbath, which they still observe as Saturday. Uh, your little boy or your little nephew could not drag a stick on the ground, for that would be considered plowing. That, that was considered plowing if you drug a stick. Right? You couldn't work, and so they had to think of well, what other ways could work be done, and so if you drug a stick, somehow that was considered plowing. Ladies, you would not be allowed to look in a mirror for fear that you might find a gray hair, right? And if you found a gray hair, what would you do to it, right? You would pluck it, maybe. And that was bad because plucking was considered shearing. Yes, that was considered shearing. And on and on, and debates were held as to what one could do or could not do on the Sabbath. So, for instance, was it allowed to eat an egg that had been laid on the Sabbath day? You say, Mosher, that is ridiculous. Well, I don't necessarily or disagree, but that's, that's what they, And the reason why they were debating that was because obviously the hen worked on that Sabbath day, so you're kind of honoring the hen by eating the produce from that hen. It was decided, how about this one? Should a man with a sore throat gargle with oil on the Sabbath? And they thought, well, gargling was work, but if he decided to drink the oil for food, that was okay, and if it helped his throat, it was just kind of an unintended consequence of eating the oil, all right? And on and on it went. Other religions have temples, and other religions have scriptures, but nothing was more sacred to the Jews than the Sabbath day. And so you're in Luke chapter 6, Luke is writing this. Remember, he's a doctor. So Dr. Luke is writing to Theophilus. Remember him from Luke chapter 1. He's writing to Theophilus, and he's trying to show, he's trying to demonstrate to Theophilus why he should believe these things. So here in Luke 6, Dr. Luke shows Theophilus that Jesus is king, and he's king in three ways. This should be important for a Jewish person. Number one, Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. Number two, Jesus is Lord over his disciples. And number three, Jesus is Lord over the diseased and the demoniacs. So these three little uh, stories that we're going to walk through, it's not intended for you to get hung up on the specifics of the Sabbath as much as it is to demonstrate, hey, Jesus is Lord over that. Uh, you got these disciples. Why are they being named? Oh, he's Lord over them too. Well, what about the spirit world? Maybe, maybe Jesus doesn't have that type of authority. No, 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 no. When Jesus is around them, he casts demons out. He's got authority over them. And so this morning our message is titled, Jesus, Lord of All. And I want us to begin, I want you to begin by seeing, number one, that Jesus is a king 
who compassionately conforms to the law. In Luke 6, what you have is this. The Pharisees are continuing to oppose Jesus. And rather than appeasing them, it appears that Jesus intentionally tweaks them. He deliberately aggravates them. Look at verse 1. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? The, the, the problem was not that Jesus and the disciples were not allowed to eat grain from someone else's grain field. That was, that was okay. You could walk along, if you were traveling, you could walk along the edge of a grain field and kind of pluck gently from the edges of, 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 the, of the field. That was okay. The, that's not the issue. The issue was the Sabbath. Why did the Pharisees have a problem? Well, here's why. To them, plucking was reaping, right? No work. Rubbing was threshing. Uh, and blowing away the chaff, that's winnowing. So you're, by doing all these things, you're, you're totally doing away with the Sabbath day. So all four acts were considered to be work on the Sabbath day. And Jesus responds to them by reminding them of a story that you and I know about from 1 Samuel chapter 21. And it's a story of King David. King David is with his men. And they end up eating some bread from the tabernacle. But the problem is this, is that bread was reserved for the priests. And, 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 da and David is actually doing it on the Sabbath day. So Jesus is teaching us this. He's teaching the Pharisees that the Sabbath was not intended. Uh, this is basic. The Sabbath was not intended to prevent individuals from eating. In fact, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus says this, that the Sabbath is not for man... But man, actually I put it, I said it the wrong way around, <clears throat> that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so Jesus concludes by saying this, <clears throat> the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And here's how, it would have, here's how it would have rung in the ears of these Pharisees. It would have read this way. And this is, the, this is in the original languages underneath there. Here it is. Lord, over the Sabbath. And then you would say, Son of Man. What, what Jesus was basically saying is, is this, I am God over this day. I, I do not fall under all these various minutiae of the law, the applications that you have created. I am God. And so he continues in verse 6. So look at Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 6. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. A man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath. So they're, they're scouting him out so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to him, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? See, the Pharisees had one rule. The only way which you could work on a Sabbath day was if you were going to save a man's life. The man's hand is atrophied, right? But so his life is not in jeopardy. Basically, the Pharisees are saying this, save that healing for Monday, or save that healing for Sunday. And watch how Jesus interacts in verse 10. And after looking around at all of them, at them all, he said to them, he said to this man, stretch out your hand. And the man did so, and his hand was restored. In effect, Jesus is saying this, it may be your kind of Sabbath to leave men hungry and to leave men disabled. But as the king of the Sabbath, my Sabbath is different. Jesus never broke the Sabbath, yet he cared nothing for the endless man-made applications of the day. And Christ's lordship over the Sabbath is, is, is a demonstration that Jesus, here it is, that Jesus uses his authority for good. That is, that is key. Beloved, when I use 
words like authority, lordship, kingship, how do you respond internally? Does that kind of like make you feel a little bit uncomfortable when you use words like that? But here's why. We tend to think of authority as bad, right? But we tend to think of authority as bad, only benefiting the one in power. But this is not your Christ. Jesus is a, Jesus is a compassionate king. He bore the punishment. Do you understand? He bore the punishment that was rightfully yours. The scripture's take is this, is that it was your sin and my sin that separated us from God. Christ was separated from the Father. Why? So that you could be reconciled. The Bible's position is that your sin nailed Christ to the cross. That Christ was punished for your sin. That Jesus left the glory of heaven and he walked the sin-cursed earth for one purpose. And the purpose was this. To accomplish the plan of his father. What's that? To give his life as a substitute of sins. Christian, Jesus is not a king. He's not an authority out for himself. Jesus is an authoritative, compassionate king to do what? To serve his people. He does not lay laws down simply to kind of control and manipulate. He is a compassionate king. That is, we can put it this way. Your Savior, Grace Life. He bore the curse of sin. He bore the wrath of God. He bore the pain of the cross. For what purpose? To give you eternal life to give you forgiveness of sins. He, that is, he fed you spiritual food when no one else would. He healed you when no one else could. This is your compassionate king. Someone asked uh, Martin Luther once, why do you preach the gospel? As one of his members of his church there in Germany. Why do you preach the gospel every week? Luther or Martin? Pastor Martin, whatever they call it. Why do you preach the gospel every week? He said, because my people forget the gospel every week. Folks, what, we, what we're finding here in the, in the gospel of Luke is this, just this constant reiteration that Christ gave himself. Why did he give himself? To accomplish his father's plan. What is his father's plan? To reunite what was broken back in the garden by our sin. So I want you to see that Jesus is a good King. His authority is not manipulative for his own ends or to control for his own means. His authority is for good of his sheep. And this thread of Christ's lordship, it weaves its way through the text. And this time, Jesus shows his kingship by his disciples, by the disciples he chooses. So I want you to see, second of all, this morning, Jesus is a king who calls people by name. And we actually learn that Jesus has more followers than the 12. So look at verse 12 for a moment. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and he chose from them the 12, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James, and John and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, uh, Judas, the son of James, <clears throat> and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. I want to briefly walk through and give just quick bio sketches of each one of these disciples, and we'll learn more about them as we walk through the Gospel of Luke. Peter. Who is Peter. Peter is an impetuous, impetuous Gal Galilean fisherman. He is the leader of the 12 apostles. Every time you see a, a list of the, uh, the disciples in the Gospels, whose name do you find first? Peter, James, and John, typically. 
He writes two books that bear his name, First and Second Peter. The tradition says he was crucified upside down in Rome. Andrew is Peter's brother. Every time you read about Andrew in the Gospels, what do you find about Andrew? He's constantly bringing people to Jesus. In fact, it's Andrew who brings Peter to Jesus initially. How did Andrew find his end? Andrew was giving the gospel and a governor's wife, kind of a, a territorial region, a governor's wife became a follower of Christ. Soon, that governor's brother also converted to Christianity. The governor became so enraged that Andrew himself became a martyr. In fact, he said something to this effect that he was unworthy to be crucified on the same shape cross that Jesus died. And so he was not shaped in what you and I know as a Roman cross, but was crucified uh, on, a, on a cross that looked like an X. We refer to this as St. Andrew's cross, if you see that flag. James, he is a, a member of the inner circle. He's the first of the twelve to become a martyr. He preaches in Jerusalem and Judea and is eventually beheaded by one of the Herods. John, you know who John is. John is uh, the brother to James. He writes the Gospel of John. This is not John the baptizer. This is a different John. John writes uh, the Gospel of John. He writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He writes the book of the Revelation. He's a fisherman as well. He's the only apostle or only disciple to not have been martyred. He actually is exiled onto an island called Patmos. And it was there on that island of Patmos that he writes the book of the Revelation. Philip. Tradition says that he too preaches and he dies as a martyr at Iropolis, which is a Greek town. Here's what's unique about Philip. When Philip meets Christ, what does Philip do? He goes and he gets Nathaniel. And he says to Nathaniel, Hey, we have found him of whom uh, Moses and the prophets did write. So what we learn of Philip is he's constantly bringing people to the understanding of who Jesus is as Messiah. Nathaniel or Bartholomew, that people, historians think that Nathaniel was his first name and Bartholomew was his last name. So Nathaniel Bartholomew was one of the twelve. He was the only one to have kind of royal blood, a, a descendant of royalty. He became a missionary to Armenia. He founds, uh, he founds the Christian church in India. He too dies a martyr. Matthew, who we learned about last week, is, a, is considered a traitor to his own people as, as a tax collector. He becomes the first man to write down the teachings of Jesus in what you and I know as the Gospel of Matthew. He is a missionary of the, for the Gospel, and he too lays his net life down. Thomas. How do you and I know Thomas? We have this little adjective describing him. And we all like him because we all see a little bit of ourselves in Thomas. He's called Doubting Thomas, right? Thomas labored in Persia. Persia would be modern-day Iran, and maybe Iraq. But he, too, is eventually, after ministering in Persia and sharing the gospel of Jesus, he is martyred eventually in India. And Thomas the Doubter became Thomas the Believer when the, one of the best confessions of Christ's deity is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, where Thomas says this, My Lord... And my God. James is known as James the Lesser, or James the son of Alphaeus. He preaches in Palestine, is crucified in Egypt. Possibly he could have been the brother of Matthew. Matthew, too, is known as the son of Alphaeus. We know about a guy named Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot, you, you hear that word zealot, and what do you hear in another English word there? You hear the word zeal. Simon is a self-described terrorist, an ultra-nationalist, if you will, a Jewish nationalist. The man who would have killed in loyalty to Israel actually becomes the man who saw that God would have no forced service, no forced worship. Tradition says that he too died as a martyr. We have another Judas, not Judas Iscariot, Judas the son of, Jan uh, son of James. 
Tradition says that he was preaching and he too was martyred in modern day Iran or Persia. And then finally we have Judas Iscariot. He was a covetous, violent nationalist. He betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, silver and afterwards uh, hangs himself. The question that comes up in the text oftentimes is this, is why would Jesus choose a traitor? We certainly have passages in the Old Testament that allude to that there would be one who would betray Jesus. One simple answer could be that calling Judas to come follow him. Judas was receiving one more act of mercy. One more act of grace. One more multiple, actually multiple messages of hearing what it would mean be to become a follower of Jesus. Why walk through all those names? Friends, what Luke is trying to teach us is this, is that only Jesus can take betraying Peter and make him one of the greatest preachers of Christianity where 3,000 people come to faith in Christ in Acts chapter 2. Only Jesus can take the covetous, deceiving Matthew and reorient his affections to generosity. Only Jesus can take the, the racist ethnocentrism of Simon the Zealot and get him to love tax-collecting Matthew. Only Jesus could take, could take local Jewish men, who many of them are fishermen, to spread the gospel to regions of the world untouched by Jesus and his good news. But only Jesus could take a skeptic and make him a believer. Here, but only Jesus can take you with all the baggage, with all the stuff of life, with what makes you you, with your character deficiencies and your character strengths. Only Jesus can take you from where you once were and bring you to where you are today. Only Jesus can take the foul mouth blasphemer and make him, make him a worshiper on Sundays. Jesus exercises his authority by calling his disciples to salvation and then commissioning them because he calls them apostles, meaning you are a sent one. Friends, that this authority, this kingship, this lordship isn't just over some day that you and I know nothing about and maybe really don't even care. But now Jesus' authority is personal. He calls us by name. And finally, Jesus is a king who commands the diseased and the demoniacs to obey. Look at verse 17. He came down with them, with those twelve, and he stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him. For power came out from him and healed them all. Dr. Luke is trying to teach us that Jesus is no longer just up in Nazareth. He, he's not just up in Galilee anymore. But that people from all over Israel know where he is or who he is. This is, obviously you can see Judea and Jerusalem. It says there were people from uh, Galilee. You say were people from Tyre and Sidon. That's this little jut up here to the tip. Sidon would be somewhere over here. Jesus is probably, this next section that we'll deal with next week is what you and I call the Sermon on the Mount would be to the north of what is the Sea of Galilee. And they came to be healed of their diseases. 
and to be relieved of demonic beings. Jesus' authority is over all. Luke is presenting that this is what life is like under Jesus' lordship. When Jesus is king, this is what life will look like permanently. No atrophied hands. Compassionate care for those in his good kingdom. So if this is Jesus as king right here, what would it look like for the subjects who live in this kingdom? What would it look like if we were to follow this king? Well, that's the next section that we'll read about next week from verses 20 through verse 36. That those who are members of this spiritual kingdom, who have confessed Jesus as their king, this is what it would look like. So Jesus shows us his kingship by healing on the Sabbath, by calling and commissioning his disciples by name, by exercising authority over demons and demon or demoniacs and diseases. But folks, I, I want us to consider Christ's authority, not just over the Sabbath or just over a, a, the apostles and the demons, but I want us to consider Christ's authority over me over you. Christian, Christ's authority isn't just a cosmic authority. It's, it's not just kind of a pie in the sky. Well, someday Jesus will exercise this authority. No, G what, what does Jesus' authority look like? Here's what it would look like. It would look like this. It would be Christian churches kind of lighting or kind of placed all throughout the land. And people who comprise those Christian churches. If you want to see what the spiritual kingdom will look like someday, then just look in the Christian churches because these are people who are living under the good reign and good rule of their king. What does Christ's authority look like for you and me? Friends, does God, let me put that, I ask it this way, does Christ have the authority to challenge your preconceived about ideas about God? Does the word of God have that type of authority where it can actually alter what you think about God? And not just about God, but about how God should be worshipped. The reformers. The reformers had a phrase called reformanda, semper reformanda. And it's meant this, reformed and always reforming. Meaning this, a reformed church simply means a church that is willing to conform and reform itself, how? To the Bible. Which makes this. A reformed church or a Christian church is comprised of what? Reforming Christians. Christian, can you think back over this, I don't know, let's start January of 2019. Can you think back to ways that you have been challenged from the Word of God and how you live? Your thinking, your living, your worshiping that reflects your submission to Christ's authority. Now that's an important question, friend, for this reason. Right? Because if we are living in Christ's spiritual kingdom, proclaiming Christ as our king, then I would want to magnify that I am under submission to Christ. Does, let me, let me ask it this way. Does, how, how this, does Christ, does Christ's authority extend into how you raise your children? 
Can you think about ways that you actually have altered the natural way you would think about raising your children and you're doing things differently because the Word of God says X? Does Christ, does, all right, let me get political. Does Christ's authority extend to red state Christians who say, I want to keep my money? And just so that we have equal opportunity for everybody, does Christ's authority extend to blue state Christians to say, I own my own body? My point isn't for you to kind of go, whoa, where are all that? My point is to say this. Does Christ have authority in every nook and cranny of your life? I don't know how you translate nook and cranny in Spanish. I'm sorry. <laughs> Does Christ have the authority to commission your son or your daughter to another country to share the gospel? Or your grandchildren. My prayer is this. Is that I, as I have been preaching. That the spirit of God. Has been placing his finger. On your heart. To say this is an area. In which you have not relinquished authority. My confidence is not in some. Magical applications that I have given. My confidence is this, is that if you have been bought by the blood of Christ, you have the spirit residing, living within you, active. He's got your number. His fingers are all over your heart. And whatever the spirit of God, however he is convicting you and bringing you to the reality of some unsubmissive way of life, that you would reflect that Jesus is Lord over all. Let's pray.